your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 10. And as you're turning there, please remember that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The title of our message this morning is The Wisdom That Was Hidden Before the World Was. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Though it is not a wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, But God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. God, may this text come to life in the midst of us today. That by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would impart to us that secret and hidden wisdom that you decreed before the ages for our glory. We ask that you would do this for Jesus' sake. That his name would be magnified this morning and we would remember that we are glad because of him. All right, please be seated. One of the glories of Scripture is, of course, the very earthiness of it, isn't it? God speaks to us in very understandable ways. For instance, Proverbs 26.11 says, Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool that repeats his folly. Have you ever seen a dog do that before? I would say that the only thing that is grosser than a dog throwing up is a dog that goes back and eats it. That's what scripture says a fool is like when he continues to return to his foolishness. Now, Paul doesn't use that imagery in our text, but that is his theme, and his imagery is actually far more sobering. The Corinthian church was returning to the foolishness of the world, and like the world, they had become self-righteous, fleshly, and factional. Remember, they were dividing themselves up. Chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, each of you says, I follow Paul. Or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 18, Paul started arguing against that position. And he's continuing that argument this morning. In our passage, Paul uses the most sobering argument. He says that the wisdom of this age that you're returning to, Corinthians, is doomed. To pass away, verse 6. And he says, that wisdom of the world is what crucified the Lord of glory, verse 8. So in essence, Paul is asking them, why would you now return to this worldly wisdom that has shown itself to be so foolish? And of course, there's an immediate application for us, isn't there? It wasn't just the Corinthians that return to the world's way of thinking. This is the story of the whole Bible. Israel desired to return to Egypt after God delivered them from slavery. Numbers chapter 14, verse 4. Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They 
pined for the way that the world did things. This is a very real danger that all of us face, the desire to return back to Egypt, to think like the world thinks. So let me ask you just a couple questions. How do you think about your life? What controls the way that you make decisions from day to day? Is it what the world tells you to do or what God tells you to do? Or how would you finish this sentence? In order to be fulfilled in my life, I need fill in the blank. Now, how you answer that question reveals whether you're operating by the world's wisdom or by God's wisdom. So here's our big idea this morning. There are only two types of wisdom. The wisdom of this world, which leads to the grave, or the wisdom of God, which leads to glory. Three parts to our message this morning. The first part is the wisdom that is doomed to pass away, that'll be verse 6. Second part is the wisdom that was decreed before the ages, that'll be verses 7 and 8. And then thirdly, the wisdom that cannot be seen, heard, or imagined. That's in verse 9. So let's begin. The wisdom that is doomed to pass away. Now if you were in the Corinthian church, it would have been very understandable for you to think that Paul was an anti-intellectual. Because so far in this letter, he has completely assaulted wisdom. In chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, he said that God destroyed wisdom. In verses 22 through 25, he said that God's wisdom is wiser than men. In verses 26 through 31, he said that God chose only the most foolish people to be saved. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he said that he didn't preach with plausible words of wisdom. So many have concluded that Paul was against knowledge or that he encourages ignorance. And unfortunately, many Christians throughout the ages have concluded that if you really want to be spiritual, you need to be anti-intellectual, anti-doctrinal, anti-theological. The more knowledge that you have, the less spiritual that you are. That is tragic, and that is not what Paul is saying at all. Notice he begins in verse 6 with the word yet. Yet, among the mature, we do impart wisdom. In other words, though I have seemingly spoken so negatively about wisdom, it is in fact wisdom that I preach. However, The wisdom that he imparts or teaches is only for the mature. Yet among the mature, we impart wisdom. Many ancient commentators, Clement and Chrysostom and Origen, believe that when Paul said the mature here, he meant the advanced Christians. In other words, Paul did teach true wisdom, but it was only to advanced Christians and not to immature babes in Christ. Is that what Paul means? No, not at all. For two reasons. First of all, this interpretation doesn't fit in the context at all. If mature only means the advanced Christians, then what is this wisdom that he is teaching? Chapter 1 already told us in verse 24, Christ is the wisdom of God. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is this wisdom that he's preaching. Who does he preach this gospel to? Everyone, advanced Christians and babes alike. Every Christian is a Christian that he is speaking to, that he imparts this wisdom to. The second reason why mature can't mean only the advanced Christians is because that would mean that Paul is teaching that there is, in fact, different classes of Christians, an elite and a not-so-elite. Now, if Paul did that, Don't you see how he'd be shooting himself in the foot? Because that's the very thing that he's arguing against in this first and second chapter. You can't fight factionalism with more factionalism. So then who are these mature? 
They're believers. All of us. Paul thus far has not been contrasting mature believers with immature believers. He's been contrasting believers from those who are perishing. And so verse 6 is essentially saying, yet among the mature, those who are saved, we do impart wisdom. Now, of course, that's not to say that they're not immature Christians. Of course there are. But that's not the contrast that Paul is making here. What is this wisdom that he teaches? Well, first he teaches it negative. He, he, he talks about it negatively. Halfway through verse 6, he says this wisdom is not a wisdom of this age. And we must affirm here that Paul is not criticizing legitimate human knowledge. The Bible is clear that everything that God has made is an object of our study and our delight. Psalm 111 verse 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. The reason why we can delight in all of the subjects is because truly God is the object of all of them. Who is the greatest mathematician? God. The greatest scientist? God. The greatest architect? God. So Paul is not criticizing that type of human knowledge. Rather, he's criticizing the type of human knowledge that is in rebellion against God. Psalm 10.4, the, the type of wisdom that says, there is no room for God in my thoughts. Or Romans 1.21, the type of human wisdom that although they knew God, they did not honor him or give thanks to him. Dear congregation, that is the fundamental and root sin that corrupts all worldly wisdom, ingratitude towards God. The difference between the worldly philosopher and the Christian philosopher is that the Christian philosopher understands that all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. But the worldly philosopher just sees Christ is just another man. The difference between the worldly scientist and the Christian scientist is that the Christian scientist is in awe of all of the laws of physics that God in his infinite wisdom has conceived. But the worldly scientist sees only an impersonal abstract force for which he owes no one praise. So the, the wisdom of this age is a wisdom that has no Gratitude, no awe, no humility, no praise towards God. Paul continues in verse 6, saying, Nor does he teach the wisdom of the rulers of this age. This age. All the rulers between the first and second coming of Christ. These are the people that humanity follows. Those of great influence. The prominent scientists and politicians. The elite darlings of the world. Why does humanity follow these people? Kava notes here that these people alone appear in the view of the world to be the most clear-sighted and the most wise. They're the experts. They're the intellectual aristocracy. But here we arrive at our first principle this morning. The wisdom of this world and all who hold to it are doomed to pass away. That's our first principle. The wisdom of this world is doomed to pass away. Paul says at the end of verse 6 that these things are doomed to pass away. And the history of the world proves that God severely judges those who rebel against him. Just consider when Moses warned Pharaoh to let his people go, Pharaoh refused. What was his end? He was thrown into the sea. Exodus 14 says that the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea and none of them remained. When King Herod, using his worldly wisdom, did not give God the glory in one of his speeches, in a speech, it says the angel Lord struck him and he was eaten with worms and he died. When Belshazzar, king of Babylon, ex exercised his worldly wisdom and got 
drunk using the vessels from the Lord's temple, the prophet Daniel pronounced his doom. He said in Daniel 5, you've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, the God in whose hand is all your breath. You have not honored him. Therefore, God has brought it to an end. That means you and all of Babylon. And that very night, Belshazzar was killed. And all who have walked according to this way, this wisdom of the world, will be brought to this same fate. I was just reading Psalm 37 yesterday. And it was, this is the inheritance of the righteous. This is the inheritance of the wicked. This is the inheritance of the righteous. This is the inheritance of the wicked. Listen to what the psalmist says. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. The wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They will vanish like smoke. They will vanish away. Now listen to me very carefully. That is your fate if you have not submitted to the wisdom of God. Meaning if you are not a Christian. The same charge against Belshazzar applies to you. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And perhaps you're saying to yourself, well, I don't, I don't want to become a Christian because if I become a Christian, the world will laugh at me. They'll think that I'm a fool. That's true. They will. But there's going to be another one laughing at the end of your life. In that same place in Psalm 37, 13, it says that the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees his day is coming. Dear friend, it's true that the world thinks that the things of God are foolish, that holiness and peace of conscience and the worship of God and the love of neighbor, that the world thinks that all of those are foolish and trifle things. But what does the world offer to you as a substitute? Does it offer you Wisdom to escape the wrath that is to come? Does it offer you wisdom to save your soul when God requires it from you? As certainly as judgment came for Pharaoh and Herod and Belshazzar, it's coming for you. You can't escape it. Each day that passes is closer to it, and the scripture only offers one remedy flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was crucified. That's the the message of the Bible. Jesus was crucified for sinners. And he was put to death for everyone who puts their trust in him. If you follow your own wisdom, you will perish. But if you receive the wisdom that he offers you, you will never die. The scripture says that all who receive him to those who believe upon his name, he gives the right to become the children of God. And the children of God will never perish. Now, dear believer, do you see Paul's logic in verse 6 for the rest of us? Paul is asking the Corinthians, why do you adopt the world's way of thinking when it's doomed to pass away? The question is for us as well. They were guilty of worldly thinking because of their self-righteousness. How are we guilty of worldly thinking? How we adopted the world's way of thinking? Think about your money. What does the world say about your money? It's yours. And you're free to spend it however you want. But what does God tell us? Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy or where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Which wisdom is doomed to pass away? Think about the Lord's day. What does the world say about the Lord's day? Sunday's unimportant. It's just like any other day of the week, and there are far more better ways to spend your time. What does God tell us? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And our Lord Jesus Christ himself promises that when we gather together, when two or three gathered in his name, there he will be in the midst of us. Brothers and sisters, Christ is in our midst right now. 
what wisdom is doomed to pass away? Or think about politics. Picked all the hard ones, right? What does the world say about politics? Everything depends on the election in November. America will either perish or it will be saved. And whatever side of the spectrum, both parties are saying that. What does God say? He removes kings and sets up kings. My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. Which wisdom is doomed to pass away? How the world thinks about everything is diametrically opposed to the way that God thinks. So test yourself, beloved. Are you adopting God's wisdom or the world's? Dave, in our Sunday school class this morning, he had said that uh, everything is religious. All of life is religious. That's how God thinks about life. The world says that there are some areas in your life that God's really not concerned about so much. You're sovereign over these things. Test yourself. That's the first point, that the wisdom of this world is doomed to pass away. Let's look at our second point, that the wisdom, the wisdom that was decreed before the ages. Now, Paul just showed us what wisdom is not, and now he's going to show us what wisdom is, true wisdom. Look at with me at verse 7, please. He says, but we, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Three parts to this. This wisdom is from God, number one. Number two, this wisdom is secret and hidden. And number three, this wisdom is only for God's people and for their glory. So let's look at those one at a time. First of all, this wisdom is derived from God. Verse 7 says, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, meaning that this wisdom has no human origin. When we preach the Bible, we are not claiming that these words found their origin in Paul or David or Moses. That's not what the Bible claims. 2 Peter 1.21 says that no scripture was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible leaves absolutely zero room for compromise. It cannot be said. You cannot say this about the Bible. That the Bible is full of many good teachings, but it's not God's word. The Bible claims to be from God. If that's not true then this thing is a lie and all of it should be thrown out. But if it is true, then that means everything that it says is right and anything that the world says that opposes it is false. Secondly, verse 7, this wisdom that we're talking about, this wisdom is secret and hidden. Again, verse 7 says, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom. Now, this doesn't mean that God's word is puzzling or his wisdom is puzzling. Those words mean that God's wisdom has been concealed. That's what hidden means, covered. Only to those who are initiated can understand it. In fact, Human reason can never understood, understand what this wisdom from God is. Before Christ came into the world, Plato, humanity's most brilliant philosopher, once lamented that the only way that the world could come to a perfect knowledge of religion is if a future instructor was sent from God. He said, you may pass the remainder of your days in despair If God does not send you some other instructor. That's profound. That's before Christ came into the world. That a pagan philosopher could have come so close to the truth. But he didn't have it. It can never be known through the wisdom of the world. Thirdly, this wisdom is only for God's people. 
for their glory. Paul finishes verse 7 by saying, But we impart a a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. What does that mean? It means that God ordained or determined that all of his people, everyone who belongs to him, would come into this secret and hidden knowledge. And this happened before time itself. This is perhaps, I think, the most amazing verse that Paul has spoken in this letter so far. Before the first minute passed in this universe, before the sun or the moon or the stars, when all there was was God, this infinitely happy and holy God, sovereignly purposed that you and I would be taught this secret and hidden wisdom, and it would be for our glory. Our glory. When Paul says that here, he means everything that pertains to our salvation, everything that's included in it. Which means that this gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is this wisdom that Paul is speaking about. The gospel is this great mystery that Paul is imparting. Therefore, we arrive at our second principle. God's wisdom leads not only to our salvation, but to our glory. God's wisdom leads not only to our salvation, but to our glory. Do you see the fundamental contrast between verse 6 and verse 7? The wisdom of the great men of this world ends in their, what, destruction, verse 6. But in verse 7, God's wisdom leads not only to our salvation, but for our everlasting joy. I mean, think about the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man built his life on worldly wisdom. But Lazarus had been shown this secret and hidden wisdom of God. How did the rich man live? He lived with no regard to God, with only regard to himself. Luke's gospel says that every day he lived sumptuously. How did Lazarus live? Well, he loved God and he loved his Christ. However, Luke's gospel says that he was greatly afflicted. He was covered with sores and even the dogs came and licked them. He was so poor that he would have wished to have the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Lazarus suffered greatly. And then the story goes like this. They both died. And then we see the other side. The rich man had peace for 70 years at best. But Lazarus has peace for endless ages. The rich man's sufferings began on the day of his death, but Lazarus on the day of his death was welcomed into God's everlasting arms. The rich man has more agony in hell than he had comfort here on this earth. But Lazarus had more glory in heaven than he ever suffered here. What a vivid contrast between those two types of wisdom. The rich man lived by worldly wisdom. Lazarus was was given the secret wisdom of God. Who would ever choose that wisdom of the world given that type of picture? However, Paul's argument in this section is that The gospel is something that the world can't see, can't grasp. It's hidden from them. Look at what he says in verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood this, that is God's secret wisdom, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Who are these rulers that... Paul's speaking about here. In verse 6, it was more general. It was all of the rulers between the first and second coming. But here in verse 8, he gets more specific because he says these rulers killed the Lord of glory. So he, at the very least, is referring to 
the Jewish high priest Caiaphas and the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, they, along with many others, crucified Christ. And they did so, why? Because they didn't understand this wisdom. What? We need to be very careful how we think here. It's not that they didn't cognitively grasp the gospel. Caiaphas knew what Jesus was saying. It's that they didn't welcome it personally. They didn't receive it. Pilate knew what Jesus was saying, but it was too far-fetched for him to believe. They didn't receive the gospel as true truth. Why? Two reasons. First reason that the wise of the world do not receive the gospel is because God has hidden it from them. This is one of those difficult truths that you have to wrestle with, but this is what the Bible says. God has hidden his wisdom from the wise. Jesus said himself in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. This is God's sovereign prerogative. But there is a second answer. The second reason why they didn't understand the gospel is because they were willingly ignorant of it. In other words, they didn't want to understand it. They don't believe because not of any intellectual problem, but because their hearts are hardened with sin. Ephesians 4.18 says they were darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. And the greatest proof for the hardness of these rulers' hearts is they crucified the Lord of glory. How hard does your heart have to be to crucify Christ? That's what verse 8 is essentially saying. Had they understood the gospel, had they welcomed it into their heart, this would have never happened. They wouldn't have done this. Dear congregation, I think it's important that we understand why the the gospel is so difficult for the world to accept. What is the gospel of the world? How does the world view this life and the life to come? The ancient world and the world today have the same basic understanding. Both of them assume that good people will be rewarded and bad people will be punished. The Bible says almost the exact opposite. The gospel says that God only saves bad people. Only. He only saves bad people because there's only one who is good, and that is God himself. There is none who does good. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. There is none that does good. No, not one. To believe the gospel means that you must admit that you are a wicked sinner, that you're hopeless without Christ. Christ doesn't save people who think that they're good. That's what Jesus said. I have come to call not those who think that they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. A crucified Savior is a contradiction to someone who thinks that they're basically a good person. That's why the world struggles with the gospel because they look at this, this mangled, bloodied Christ and they say, how could that save me? I'm basically good. That's our second point. Only for those whom God has shared this secret wisdom before the ages with can ever believe the gospel. Let's look at our final point. The wisdom that cannot be seen, heard, or imagined. In verse 9, Paul trots out the final reason, at least in this section, that the world cannot discover this secret wisdom of God. He says this, But as it is written, But no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 
Isn't that one of the best verses in the Bible? Paul is quoting here Isaiah 64, 4. There is a couple slight variations, but what both Isaiah and Paul assert is that no human being can understand the gospel savingly without God's enabling spirit. That's, that's the subject of verse 9, because so, some have thought that this verse is talking about heaven, but that's, that doesn't fit the context at all. Paul has not been talking about heaven. No, he's specifically been explaining this secret wisdom that he preaches. So, so walk through it with me real quick. Verse 7, but we impart, that is, we preach this secret wisdom. Verse 8, that secret wisdom that we're preaching is something that the rulers of the age do not understand. Now in verse 9, he's explaining why they don't understand it. So it could read like this. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the great things that God has laid up in the gospel for those who love him. Of course, that includes heaven, but the proper object of this verse, the subject of it, is the world's inability to grasp the gospel on their own. So let's notice two things here. First of all, Paul works by negation. Eye can't see, ear can't hear, heart can't imagine. The gospel is so hidden and above man that, that he is restricted in his ability to even speak about it. Paul is. It's kind of like how we talk about God. Some of his attributes are attributes of negation. God is immortal. He can't die. God is infinite. He's not finite. God is immutable. He can't change. So likewise here, the gospel is so excellent above man that we have to start with denial. It's so excellent that natural eyes, ears, and hearts can't conceive it. Secondly, Paul works in a progression. He's walking up a ladder. He starts with the most basic gate of human knowledge, which is our sight. Sight is the most basic way that we Bring in information. It's the building block of the scientific method, observation. But what Paul is saying is that the gospel is not something that can be understood through sight. Okay, well then, what about the next gate of human knowledge? Our hearing. We take in information through our ears. Certainly someone can teach us the mystery of the gospel, some great teacher or philosopher, but Paul says, no, no ear can hear. Finally, the last gate of human knowledge, our reason, what our heart can imagine. Certainly, if, if we just had enough time to, to think and reason, we could come into this understanding of the gospel on our own, right? But again, Paul says, no. Isn't that amazing? This is profound. These three things, sight, sound, and reason, represent the way that we understand everything in the world. Everything. But Paul is saying that is not how you understand the gospel. It can't be understood through empiricism, through sight. It can't be understood through sophism. It's the speech of great philosophers. It can't be understood through rationalism. No mind can reason their way into it. How then can one come to believe the gospel? Paul tells us in verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit. Or as J.B. Phillips says it in his paraphrase, but God has through the spirit let us share his secret. In other words, we do not believe the gospel through virtue of our own ingenuity. God himself has initiated us into another realm that's above seeing, above hearing, and above imagining. He uncovered truth that we could have never received on our own. And children, boys and girls, children... I want you guys to grasp this doctrine, and I'm going to give you this easy illustration. 
Do you ever wonder where the word gospel came from? Gospel. Gospel is from an old English word. It's made up of two words, good or God, and spell or story. So literally, the gospel is a good spell. Think about those, those stories that you read about a, perhaps a wicked witch that cast a spell on a princess. Or in Lord of the Rings, how Gandalf cast some good spells in Middle Earth. Children, what our passage is saying this morning is that the only way a person believes the gospel is if God puts a good spell on us. The clearest example of this in the scripture is Lydia in Acts chapter 16. She was sitting next to the riverside, listening to the words that Paul was preaching. Perhaps it was a sunny day. And it says in Acts 16, 14, that the Lord opened her heart to believe the things that Paul had said. It wasn't Paul's preaching that made her believe the gospel. It wasn't her seeing. It wasn't her hearing. It wasn't her heart imagining. It was that God had cast a spell on her as it were. Now, How do we know if that's been done to us? Look at the end of verse 9. But as it is written... What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. For those who love him. Why does Paul say it like that? Why couldn't he just say something like, for those who believe in him? Why did he say love? Well, because, loved ones, sometimes our faith is hidden. Sometimes Christians are plagued with so many doubts. And if you're a weak Christian here this morning, sometimes you doubt if you even believe. And so the root of our faith can be buried in black soil and and you don't even know. I, I don't even know if I believe. But then if we ask that person, but do you love Jesus? What will a true Christian say? Yes, I love him, and I wish I loved him more. See, God is actually condescending here and helping us to see the things that he has prepared for those who love him. But you may ask, well, why why does he say for those who love him? We're reformed, shouldn't it say for those whom God loves? Isn't God's love the cause of our love? Of course it is. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. So we can say with full confidence that wherever there is true love for the Lord Jesus Christ, it is what? God's love that was there first. So our love to God is is like a reflection in a mirror. You realize that, that a reflection of a man can only exist if the man is there first in the mirror. So if the reflection is there, what does it mean? The man is there. If a, if a person loves Christ, what does that mean? That he is loved by Christ. So how do we apply this passage to our lives? What's the big imperative today? It's simply this. Gratitude. All. Humility. Love. Thankfulness. Gratitude is the most powerful weapon against every vice that you have. Try it sometime. Try to be self-righteous when you are filled with gratitude towards God. Try to be given over to hatred or frustration or cruelty or the lust of the flesh if you are given over to a grateful heart of what God has done for you. This is Paul's method. Paul's trying to strip them of self-righteousness. And what does he do? Look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. He's filling up their hearts so there's no more room for this nonsense. 
So, beloved, what has God done for you? What has he done for you? He has prepared for you things that eye could never see, ear could never hear, heart could never imagine. And this idea of preparation is so vital for us to grasp. Just as, as God prepared the garden for Adam before he created Adam, so God prepared a Savior for you before you ever even came into the world. Don't you, think, don't you realize that the greatest things take the longest preparation? The greatest things in life take the longest preparation. While Solomon was still young, David, his father, started gathering stones and wood and all the building materials for the temple. And then, even when Solomon started building the greatest temple ever built, it took 20 years to build. Dear Saint, do you know how much greater your salvation is than Solomon's temple? God has been preparing it for all eternity. On the last day, you're going to hear these words before you enter into the kingdom. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for all eternity, prepared for you. God has prepared this gospel for you, first of all, by electing you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Step one in your preparation. God chose you to salvation. God prepared the gospel for you when he gave the first promise to fallen man that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. God prepared the gospel for you when he gave that first promise to Abraham when he said, in you, Abraham, will all the families of the earth be blessed. You are part of those families of the earth. You're, you're here today because God promised something to Abraham. The gospel was prepared for you when God sent prophets and priests and kings into the world, all foreshadowing the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, Christ Jesus. The gospel was prepared for you that when in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And after Christ rose from the dead, he still is preparing for you right now, beloved. What he said to his disciples in John 14 applies to you. I go and prepare a place for you. Prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Beloved, God has always been preparing the gospel for you. Isn't that something to have gratitude about? To be in awe of? To be in worship over? To have true humility created in your heart? Think about that this week. Your greatest problem is not that you're not doing enough. Your greatest problem is that you don't Look at what God has done enough. What has God done for you? Let's pray.